Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third day of the workshop on bi bird ac acoustics, migration, and citizen science. Uh, before I hand over the session to our speaker, I request all the participants to keep yourselves muted when not directly interacting with the uh, session so as to not create any background disturbance. As today is the last day of our workshop, please make sure that you uh, ask all your questions and if not, you can type them in the chat box and we'll make sure that we address all of them by the end of today's session. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, Ma'am, you can take over. All right. Uh, wonderful. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I hope that I am visible and audible. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Samakshi. Hi, Jai. Hi. Yes, you are audible and visible. Always. Uh, let me share my screen. So today, both of us will be taking the session. And um, I will begin and Samakshi will close the session today. Uh, let me share my screen. Let me know if my screen is visible to you. Yes, yes. Just a minute and try and go into slideshow mode because sometimes it is better. Uh, do you see what do you see on my screen at the moment? Your first slide is there, Jay. Just a slide, so it's in the it's slide. Not... Okay, all right. And I'm also open the chat so that I can have a view of everything that's going on. Yeah, all right. Um, so welcome to all of you on day three of uh, today's session, which is on, that we know by now, it's on bird acoustics, migration patterns, and citizen science. Glad to see that so many of you have joined today. Um, and today's session, like I mentioned a little while ago, will be taken both by Samakshi and me. So I'll go first, and then Samakshi will be closing today's session. Um, our pattern will be more or less the same, like uh, what we did on day one and day two. So we will begin with a quick recap if you could tell me what you remember, one thing, okay? One thing that you remember from yesterday. Can you tell me one thing that you remember from yesterday? You can unmute and let me know. The use of eBird, all right, says this widget. I hope you are more comfortable using the, the app now. How to make a checklist, all right. Checklists, bird acoustics. A little bit about app, all right. We did the bird quiz, yes, on the vocalizations, on the bird calls. And what else? Yes, we did do the quiz. All right. Um, also wanted to check with you yesterday. We gave you, I gave you a little tiny little bit of homework, right? Some conservation stories. Yes. And I hope you do look them up in greater detail. <laughs> yes. I haven't forgotten my homework. Um, can you... Did any of you take those 15 minutes to observe the birds this morning? You did? Oh, thank you, Darshit. That's nice. And what? how was your experience? Yes, Dr. Gopal. Good to know that you, you did that too. So did Viresh. Lovely. Wonderful, wonderful. Nice. Any excuse is a good excuse to go birding. Lovely. Right. And how was your experience? You saw the jungle miner versus the common miner. Okay, nice. Your experience from today? I mean, it's not that you don't bird. This is the first time you're birding. But this time you had to observe a few things, right? Did you, did, how many of you saw birds, heard bird singing? You heard a few different calls. Oh, lovely. 
Oh, right now also you you can see the bulbul and another small bird. Ah, that was point number two. Two one of the points that we had given you yesterday. Nice, nice. Anyone saw birds perched on a wall, on a wire? Pardon me. Did any of you catch birds on a wire? <laughs> yes, you did, Virish. They are fairly common, I think, in cities, right? Ninety percent of the birds were on wires. <laughs> and you talk, we talked about the hummingbird yesterday. We don't get them in India, but many people think that the sunbird is uh, the hummingbird. All right, very nice. I'm so glad that um, we are also involved. You also saw the black-shouldered kite today. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, beaters, sunbirds. Oh, Vijesh was traveling. Okay, nice. On the wire, you saw the... And did you see any blackbirds? You saw the hoopoe, pigeons. Lovely. The magpie robin. Lovely, lovely, lovely. So I, it looks like you had a nice, good 15 minutes, a fun-filled 15 minutes, and that was, uh, you saw some yellow-colored bird with a long black tail. Oh. Arun, where did you see it? A yellow-colored bird with a long black tail. You saw the I also cannot guess that. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, was it, is, could it be an Oriole? Maybe looking slightly different. Uh, maybe, maybe. Near your home, and where is your home, Arun? Interesting, nice. See, so Arun, you saw a um, yellow colored bird with a long tail, something that uh, long black tail, that too. Uh, could it be the Rufus tripi, which is not yellow, it is orangish, orangish brownish? You saw the Rufus tree by Darshid did. Okay, you saw yellow-footed green pigeons. You're in Tamil Nadu, in Kanchipuram. Wow, lovely. How lucky. Okay, so I don't, I'm not familiar with birds from Tamil Nadu. So I haven't seen this bird from the description that you gave. But yeah, nice, nice, nice. Good. All right. So now that we've, uh, you know, we've gone through our homework, we looked, did a quick little recap. Like yesterday, we'll do a short little quiz, a true or false quiz. Again, five short questions. Okay. Tell me whether it is true or false. You need a different ID and password for Merlin, eBird, and Birds of the World. True or false? False, said Darshit. Piresh agrees. So does Dr. Gupal. So with one login ID, I thank you, thank you. All of you agree that this is false. As we mentioned uh, day before and we mentioned again yesterday with just that one ID with Cornell Lab of Ornithology, you get access to all three tools, right? Uh, and three of them have three different functions. One is for identification. One is more for keeping a record. Um, of course, also for exploring and uh, uh, keep, um, and the third one is more like an encyclopedia, a kind of a reference uh, reference point, right? Good. Okay, great. Now point number two. The call and song of the bird is the same thing. False. Wonderful. So a bird song is different. In fact, it's, a bird can have many songs, many calls. Okay. Both are different. Very good. Nice. Multiple checklists can be made into one trip report. True or false? Nice. True. This is true. And I think we saw some trip reports yesterday uh, where we were clubbing multiple checklists. We, we showed you an example. And I hope that now you can also create checklists and you can share it with your friends. Okay, next one. Bioacoustics is the study of bird calls. True or false? Very good. I thought this would be a trick question, but you are very, I'm in front of a very smart audience, very, not just birds, but it is all organisms, right? False. Very nice. Bird watchers can make excellent ambassadors for nature conservation. True or false? This Virish says it's true. And so do all of you. And I agree with you too, right? Um, 
as bird watchers, once we, particularly once we start keeping a record on a, a tool which is accessible by all or accessible by many, open to all, uh, in, we contribute to citizen science and then and there are other ways in which, of course, bird watchers can become ambassadors. Many of them take, you know, work with, then can go into habitat, uh, protection of habitat, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many ways in which we can contribute. And of course, the simplest way is by creating awareness. So, right, we, uh, bird watchers, so you, me, all of us can be excellent ambassadors for nature conservation. And perhaps many of you are already somewhere there in, in you know, little Little bits, we are probably all doing it. We need to maybe accelerate that and amplify that. All right, moving on. I want you to consider this scenario, okay? You want a change of scenery. So you set up with your clothes on your back, your innate knowledge of the world, and you zip off to your destination. You have no maps, no smartphones, no GPS, nothing. Would you be able to travel thousands of kilometers across oceans and continents and then get back home a few months later? Would you? This is a... Priyanka says no. What about the others? <laughs> Vijay says, if I'm lucky, yes. <laughs> nice. Sapna says no, Dr. Gopal says no, right? For us, it seems like a very, very difficult task, right? Darshit says my navigation skills are not that dependable, so less possibilities, right? But imagine, imagine lots of birds do this and they do this repeatedly every year. In fact, they do this twice a year. Many birds do it twice a year, right? They go from one place to the other and then they come back. Do you know what this phenomenon is called? I mean, I know you know what this phenomenon is called. Can you tell me what it is called? <laughs> right. Absolutely. So today we will look at migration in a little bit more details. Okay. So yesterday we kind of focused on being a citizen scientist. We looked more at eBird. We looked at how bird watchers can... Uh, you know, contribute to citizen science. Uh, we looked at bioacoustics. We look, looked at, and of course, then we moved from general bioacoustics to bird acoustics. We looked at, uh, uh, we looked at bird calls, tried and see how we can use them to identify birds and all that. Today, we are going to look a little bit more. At least today, I am going to talk a little bit more about migration. And Samakshi will uh, talk about data visualization. All right. Now, a little bit about. Do you know the story of the Aristoc? You know, earlier people used to think that, uh, you know, they would see some birds and then they would not see them for some parts of the year, right? And uh, people would think, in fact, our great Aristotle thought, many, many people thought many things, okay? Aristotle was one who said that birds, they become another bird. Because in winter you see one bird and in summer you see a different bird, right? So he said that birds actually transform from one bird to another. Okay, some people believed that uh, they hibernate, that they bury themselves under the, in, in the mud on riverbanks. Okay, some people used to even believe that birds flew to the moon because uh, they have the ability of flight, right? And then there's uh, Francis Willoughby who suggested in his book Ornithologia that some birds go to warmer climates. But it was only when a hunter in this place in Germany called Rostock, okay, he one day he was hunting and he shot this stalk that you see here. And when he went and he saw the stalk closely, he realized that the stalk had this spear, exactly the way you see it, okay, right running through it. What he found most interesting or what was more interesting to all of us was this talk had this spear which was, whose origin was in Africa, which meant that this talk had flown about 3000 kilometers down to Africa before winter. Okay. And then perhaps that's where the bird uh, got speared. And despite having the spear 
in this dog. It flew. Imagine how powerful or how strong this bird was. It managed to continue with, with its migration. And it, while you were, of course, uh, flying over Germany, it got shot. So this bird was actually not a very lucky, lucky fellow. But what, uh, even though the bird was unlucky, it was lucky for us because that was uh, the first time that people really or began to understand migration. They looked at this bird and they realized that this bird was coming from Africa thanks to the spear that was embedded in it. And then what the, today this, this stalk has been, you know, taxidermed and it is found in the Natural History Museum of uh, Rostock. So if you ever are there, you can actually see it because, and this has kind of, uh, it's called the arrow stalk. Um, and this is the stalk that kind of led us, gave us clue into where birds go when we stop seeing them. And, and you know, first steps towards scientists learning about this beautiful phenomenon called migration. All right, moving on. So what is migration, right? Migration in its essence is movement of birds from one place to the other, right? What, what, what do you think is migration? Of course, in the case of, I should be specific, bird migration, because migration in general, like we saw yesterday, is done by other species too. Right? We also have uh, people migrating from one city to the other, right? or towns too. We have migrant workers. So migration amongst birds or most species of animals is a fundamental biological strategy. Okay, And what does it encompass? What does it contain? Movement of individuals or sometimes a group from one place to another. And often these movements are driven by certain conditions, right? It could be food, and we look at those conditions, change of seasons. So when seasons change, it becomes too cold, food becomes scarce, they move, birds are smart, right? We, we saw that yesterday, we, we, we realized that. So they move from one place where food becomes scarce to another where food is more abundant, okay? Um, what we consider so from a, they move to their wintering grounds and India is a wintering ground for many birds right of course so they move from their breeding ground to their wintering grounds these are terms that you might want to get familiar with if you are uh, you know working with birds uh, breeding ground is where most birds breed and often it's in summer when the weather is fine when food is abundant and then when it becomes cold, particularly in the colder countries uh, or for us in the higher altitudes, when it becomes cold, then the birds move towards a warmer place, right? Where again, food will be more abundant, uh, conditions will be more suitable, right? And like I said, it is a biological uh, strategy. And often birds have to travel extremely long distances, right? Uh, do you know of uh, migrants who travel, who's the champion who travels the longest distance? Do you know of this bird? Which bird does that? And that bird, ah, yes. I was about to say that recently that bird was seen in Mumbai. Yes, it is the Arctic tern, right? Uh, the Arctic tern is like, it, I think, travels, I, I'm not sure of how many kilometers, but it, it's one of, it travels the farthest Okay, amongst birds, uh, when it is migrating from, I think, uh, the, the Arctic region towards it comes south, right? To south, from North Pole to south, perhaps. Um, I think it moves more towards the Latin America. Uh, yeah, so from the north, it moves from the Arctic regions, it moves towards the south. All right, so hence perhaps the name, Arctic Turn. Okay, nice. Now, to look at bird, to understand bird migration better, let us look at, understand, or ask a few questions, right? Um, why do birds need to migrate? We talked about a little bit a little while ago, because when it becomes too cold, especially when, when it snows and things like that, food becomes extremely scarce. So one, climatic conditions, uh, food is scarce, water is scarce, uh, 
you know you don't want too much competition so you move to a place where there is lesser lesser birds so less competition for food uh, perhaps nesting is better in in the place where you will go because you're moving back to your breeding ground um, better breeding grounds all right better conditions in that breeding ground uh, compared to your wintering ground so migration in both both ways right um, but what is also important is questions like how do birds prepare for migration how do they even know when they should start migrating right these are questions that um, we need to think about okay uh, avishek could you explain this term that you've put zugun rohe i i'm hoping that i'm pronouncing it right but i haven't met this term before um, samakshi are you familiar with this term i missed some of the audio because of my internet can you what term was it it's there in the chat zugun rohe i think z u g u n r u h e no i i have no idea abhishek would you know what this term is what it means unfortunately i have not encountered ah it is the anxiety that they feel before they start migration lovely i didn't know that thank you i didn't know there was a, this this was the term this is what it was called thank you thank you for sharing this with us before they prepare for migration correct so many birds undergo many changes before migration okay they will start eating more you will suddenly especially um, in india no let's say around march when the birds are going back to their breeding grounds when they come to india we are the wintering ground like right? they when you see them arrive many of them have they look very tired worn out their feathers are in poor condition because they've just taken their journey right and then they eat 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 particularly i think in in if you see them around march april when it's again once again time to fly back to the breeding grounds often you will see yes because they need that fat deposits right they need the, the muscle power they need that strength so they will start eating and then for some for a while they'll actually become rather quiet because they're focusing more on eating so they actually sometimes even change their diet they'll start eating a lot more they will mold to get newer better feathers so that the they, they can you know the the new feathers can bear the brunt of the migration again uh, some birds like the bar-tailed godwit actually even you know it so what some birds do that even their internal organs the ones they don't need they shrink those organs okay so that other organs rather more the muscles become take up more space and then when they land in in the wintering grounds or the breeding grounds they regrow those organs okay so can you imagine how fascinating the birds are of course we talked about the increased food intake and all right birds will migrate uh, we talked about so how do they know when to migrate and how do they know where to go right these are also things that are interesting for us to consider now um, where do they how do they know where to go okay so how, okay before that how do they know that it is time to go so their research say or the studies have said that it's the change in light okay so it's weather basically daylight the, the amount of the duration of daylight kind of lets them know when it is time to move when it is time to migrate okay and how do they find their ways different there are many different techniques some uh, you know near the beak they say that they have uh, these uh, mag magneto receptors right and uh, so some so, i mean it's all people are studying all of this but so they say that they can birds can understand magnetic fields okay so they can see the magnetic fields which is not visible to us so they use magnetic fields at night they use stars as in many small birds you know the song birds um, because the weather is often better at night um, it's less windy at night often right so the smaller birds tend to um, migrate at night and uh, when they are so they even say that uh, they use their sensory cues right they use when they are when they begin their journey often they use odor okay they use their sense of smell 
up to, I think, thousands of kilometers to know in which direction they go. Because many birds, they go back to the same place, exact same place year after year, right? How do they know which exact place to go to? Okay, and then when they are closer to that place, they use the landmarks, visual cues. And then there are birds who migrate during the day. Now, we said the ones that migrate during night, they use stars as their, their pole, Polaris in particular, because the Polaris or the pole star doesn't move, right? Polaris is fixed. Other birds will circumnavigate. So they will, the Polaris, they will go around the Polaris, right? Or the North Star. So at night you have, let's say, the pole star to help you navigate. The magnetic fields are there, of course, to help you navigate. But during the day, the ones that uh, mi migrate during the day, do you know what, how, what is their load star? What, what do they use to orient themselves with? Any thoughts? Yes, the sun, the biggest and the brightest star. <laughs> okay, so they use the sun to those who migrate during the day. They use the sun as a, a you know point of reference, and they they move along their journey. Okay, so it's it's really fascinating how birds do this, and some of the some sometimes it's even you know like. Um, genetic right especially look at root parasites birds that lay their eggs in some other bird's nest and if you look at let's say the pied cuckoo which comes to india in and is here mostly during monsoon and then goes back right they lay their eggs in the host parents fly back how do the kids know the chicks don't have the parents to guide them yet they know where to go and how to come back right yes root parasitism so it's i mean it's absolutely fascinating. The more you think about it, it's it's just, I mean, it, to me, it feels like a miracle. Okay. There are different types of migration. Um, seasonal migration is uh, regular movement, what we were talking about between breeding ground and non-breeding ground. Okay. Like the Arctic terns, they will migrate annually from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back. Oh, we, there, there, there is it. It's from the Arctic to the Antarctic. I'd forgotten about it. Okay, they go about 7, 70,000 kilometers. And then we have the altitudinal migration, it's seen often in the mountains. For us, it's the Himalayas. So birds in the upper Himalayas, they will move down. Okay, where birds and animals, they move along different elevations seasonally to follow changes in temperature. And then, of course, with temperature, also food. Then you also have nomadic uh, migration right and local migration so what i what often we refer to as local migration is uh, you know birds that are migrating within india so some birds are there in, in one part of the year in the south of india and then in another part they will come to breed in the northern or eastern part of india and then we'll move back to the south so that uh, we call it as local migration then you have the nomadic migration where some species they are irregular or nomadic in their response to um, unpredictable changes, you know, so nomadic migration sometimes happens. In fact, those of us who were in Calcutta recently experienced the cyclone, right? In Orissa, actually, the cyclone hit Orissa finally. But as an, a lot of birds were caught in that and uh, we found them on the, a lot of pelagic birds, okay? So uh, one, a lady I know went to the coast right after the migration and she saw the noddy here. Noddy, the noddy is normally not seen here, the brown noddy. So these are nomadic migrations, right? They are not, they didn't intend to come here, but because there were these weather fluctuations, bad weather, etc., they kind of went to the nearest shore. And in this case, it was the uh, seashore that uh, was close to where the cyclone hit. Okay. And then we have longitudinal migration, thus, uh, where, you know, you move from, uh, the southern, uh, the northern hemispheres to the southern hemispheres, right, along uh, longitudes. Um, and of course, that is not restricted to uh, birds, even a lot of sea animals do that. They do longitudinal migrations. And depending on migration, birds can be classified differently, okay? So you have the passage migrant. I think yesterday we talked mm, like the golden oriole and the common hawk cuckoo. Correct. And Bhavya, you're giving examples of the golden oriole, I know, is for which type of migration? 
Correct. So I don't see them in, in Calcutta um, all through summer. I see them in winter. Like I saw them just a few days ago. Two, on two successive weeks, I saw them close to my place. So yes, local migration. Now, depending on uh, you know the kind of migration, migratory pattern, if I can say, birds follow, um, you have different... Birds are called differently. So you have a resident bird. You know who's a resident bird? Who's a resident bird? Ah, you already saw a winter visitor, the Eurasian rhinek. Lovely. I love that bird. It's such a beautifully patterned bird. I've, I'm yet to see it properly, but I've, yeah, I've had the fortune of catching glimpses of it every time. So who's a passage, uh, who's a resident bird? Sorry, I started with the resident bird. Anyone? Who's a resident bird? <laughs> House crow. You're giving me an example, okay, who is found mainly in a particular habitat. So a resident bird is a bird that you will find all year round in a particular place. They don't migrate, correct. Okay, they stay within a particular, uh, not necessarily a habitat, but within a particular space. Like uh, uh, house crow, for example, is resident in India, right? Uh, you will see house crows uh, all year round. At least it's resident in, it's a resident bird in Calcutta. Okay, house sparrows are also resident in Calcutta. I see them all year round. Red vented bulbul, I will see them all year round. So these are all resident birds. Okay, what we often call common birds that photographers don't look at, right? We kind of tend to ignore them because we see them every day. We don't even, sometimes we don't even realize that they're birds. We don't count them as birds. Sometimes we don't add them to the checklist because, oh, we see birds, there are house crows everywhere, right? Uh, here I wanted to add, I think uh, this, uh, thank you to Samakshi for bringing this up. Yesterday, remember I said it's we, it's a good practice to keep a minimum of, of uh, a checklist of 15 minutes, but under certain circumstances, you could also make a checklist of five minutes. So five minutes checklists are also allowed. It's preferred to make a 15 minute checklist. I mean, I mean, I, I tend to keep a 15-minute checklist, but a checklist of as, as, as short a checklist as a five-minute checklist is also okay. Important is that you capture data accurately and that you capture all the species that you see, not just the, you know, your lifers and the exotic ones. All right, that, that's important. It's also important that you don't um, write, uh, how should I say, overcount, right? You have, we, we just write randomly 100 words. Okay, where conservation is concerned, it's better to give smaller numbers than larger numbers. Okay, because otherwise we are the how should I, data set gets a little screwed up, messed up. A passage migrant. I think yesterday one of you talked when we were talking about the Amur falcon. One of you mentioned in the chat that it is a passage migrant. Now, who is a passage migrant, or how would you define a passage migrant? Anyone? Sir, by the time we get that answer, if I can talk a bit about yes, yes, uh, checklist. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, the the point about the uh, the point that I mentioned yesterday that in a lot of cases, fifteen minute checklists are preferred. So that is a protocol that we usually follow when we are making like you know an atlas. So for example, there are some cities like um, there's an atlas coming up in Hyderabad. There is already one for Pune. So an atlas is Atlas is um, basically, I think, a compilation of what all birds are found in a particular city. Um, so that is where the protocol that has been agreed upon is 15-minute checklist. And in a lot of other cases also, it is recommended that you put a 15-minute checklist. But say so you're standing at a place and your intention is to do bird watching and report birds. And it does not even amount to, say, five minutes. Maybe you're there just for three minutes. You can put it as a complete checklist, but you have to mention that uh, the, the time will automatically be taken up as three minutes. So when somebody is doing an analysis or something, they can maybe exclude or include your checklist. So it is okay to report whatever timing, uh, whatever time you're spending 
uh, as long as you mentioned correctly that you were traveling, was it stationary, was it incidental, uh, and was it complete or incomplete? So incomplete could be that you have, uh, you were there birding, you didn't feel like reporting uh, rock pigeons or crows. You were like, I don't want to report common birds. I will only report unique birds. So it will be an incomplete checklist. So as long as you're following the protocols, the timings might not be that stringent. So yeah, we both of us really wanted to provide that clarity. Okay, so that's all. Uh, ah, thank you, Makshi. Thank this you. Morning also. And uh, Samakshi will be showing you a little bit about, you know, what she was talking about the, um, I mean, she'll be talking a little bit about the Pune bird atlas and all in, in a bit. Okay, so, um, right. So a passage migrant is returning to their home. Uh, a bird which during the course rests for food for any reason and starts migration. Remember what the Amur falcon we said it does? It comes from Siberia, China, then it stops in India, fuels up, refuels, eats before it continues with its journey. Right? So you are absolutely right. Uh, passage migrants are birds that are not in their summer, they haven't reached their breeding grounds, either some summer grounds or winter grounds. Okay. But instead, they are passing through, okay, during autumn or spring, while they are uh, before they reach their final destination of either the uh, breeding ground or the wintering ground. So this they kind of make stopovers, like we talked about the Amur falcon. Okay, it is not their final destination, like you are all saying, and um, so that is because it's just passing through. It is there for a short while, right? In, um, like in um, the Amur falcon, we the we saw is yesterday stays in Nagaland for a month max, a month, five weeks. And then it, they one fine day you wake up and you see it's filled with all of them. And then one fine day you wake up and they are all gone. Right? So that is, these are your passage migrants. Um, and then of course, we have the summer visitors. We talked about the local movements like the Golden Odeon you talked about or the Common Hawk Papu, okay, that are seen in certain places and certain parts of the country at certain times of the year and not all year through like the residents. And of course, then you have the winter visitor. Uh, like you said, the Rhineck is a winter visitor, right? Darshit said, and uh, I, I saw it. For us, the tiger is a winter visitor and I was so happy to see the brown shrike is a winter visitor. So Amur falcon, from what I know, from what I have studied, stays for around four to five weeks. Uh, not two weeks, but it, some birds could stay for two weeks, right? It's I, I don't know whether in the documentary they're talking about Amur falcon, or I could also be wrong. I mean, uh, you know, the, my references could also be inaccurate. Um, but the point that we are trying to make is that a bird will stay for a short while. It could be two weeks, it could be four, but it's not the end uh, it is not the end result of the journey. Okay. Uh, perhaps it is an approximate also. Right. Yes. So maybe one particular individual will stay for around two weeks, but we're looking at the whole flock. Right. And, uh, and so the locals are looking at the entire flock and they say, okay, they come now and they leave now. Right. So for them, it's like they're there for around five weeks. But perhaps in those five weeks, there are many individuals who just stay for two weeks and they leave. Right? Because unless you start tagging all those individuals, we will never know for sure. Right? So perhaps that is also the case. Hmm? Um, all right. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for all your inputs. I mean, I'm learning so much from all of you. And it's always, always a pleasure. Migration comes with its own challenges. Right? It's not easy. It's not easy for the bird. It's very taxing on the birds, right? It's very energy consuming. Okay. Um, because of what are the challenges of migration? It is one is climate change. Now, what why is climate change a problem for bird migration? Uh, what happens is if the seasons are changing, the for the birds, remember we said how do birds know when to leave? They look at the duration of um, sunlight. And they know, okay, when it is approximately this time, I have so much of sunlight, it's genetic for them. They know that they have to start moving, right? They start preparing and then one fine day they move. So what will happen is if with change in weather conditions, what will happen is let's say it starts raining before, 
right now certain birds they what they do is also birds tying their arrival at their breeding grounds or their wintering grounds with the food that they want so the minute they come the food should be available right now a lot of um, insectivores what happens with them is if the season changes and let's say um, a particular crop or a particular or rain has happened before it should have happened or it is delayed when they arrive the crops or even the insects that are there because of the rain right because of the weather conditions weather conditions are different the the crops probably have not ripened as yet so the grainy birds will not get food when they come because the seeds are not yet ripe or that the insects that they get because of the rain that happens at that point of time is not there you know we believe um, amongst i mean amongst us that uh, um, when it rains the next day after the rain i mean and it's it's been uh, that, that's my observation that if it rains today heavily next day once the sun comes out there is tremendous bird activity because a lot of these insects the, all the tb crawlies start coming out right because their holes have got filled in with water and then the birds have a field day they're eating so there are a lot of activity lots of eating happening insects they're digging out insects etc now imagine all this happens before the bird has arrived when the bird comes again there is a scarcity of food right so climate change is indirectly i would say impacting the birds not really their bird migration because they're still migrating more or less at the same time but when they arrive at the wintering ground or the when they arrive at the um, breeding grounds they immediately have to start to work right they immediately have to prepare for breeding or they immediately have to start molting getting the feathers they have in place etc right now if they don't get the food what happens is it impacts their reproductive success it will impact lead to their population decline and they say that researchers researchers tend to say that um, the entire objective of a bird's life is to be able to produce its progeny to have babies and to have this next generation of birds everything they do is towards that towards the health of the eggs towards the health of their chicks towards you know uh, seeing that next generation grow so when the food when they arrive at the breeding ground and the food cycle is already messed up it impacts their reproductive success leads to a population decline right and then of course we humans are also to blame we humans are a little in some ways you could say see natural selection what is natural selection that the the strong ones will survive and the weaker ones will um, perish right so i wouldn't say my yes in many ways because even to to go through that entire journey of migration right certain birds do a very if they are not strong enough they will perish right oops sorry no oh, okay sorry so it, it you could look at it that way we are uh, you're right darshit i never thought of it from that perspective okay and then we humans don't help much uh, we, we are we look at wetlands and we say that oh they are uh, uh, or grasslands and we say they are banjar zameen and we, we say that oh they are you know uh, ponds have to be filled up because i need to make the lakes have to be filled up because i need to make homes for myself uh, i see a grassland and i say oh this is unproductive land let's uh, start uh, using it for agriculture if i can't use it for agriculture sell it and you know um, build a factory there so there is habitat loss there is habitat fragmentation it is very very difficult in today's day and age to be a bird <laughs> and uh, our migration studies are helping with conservation uh, you know how uh, you oh good lord arun i am not familiar with quantum biology i am apo apologies i can ask some experts who are familiar with quantum biology samakshi would you know anything about trying, this is a little beyond me also i will also have to read this up i haven't quantum and so, yeah it's, it's it sounds very heavy for me yeah I, unfortunately i have not come across this in any of my readings or in my interactions with uh, but maybe we can what we'll do is we'll ask experts and we can 
you know, let you know uh, whatever we our findings are. But as as of now, it is something that I have not come across, and uh, Samakshi hasn't too either. Okay, so uh, when we study migration, we can use those studies for. Uh, you know, having these, you know, the migration, there are many flyways, okay, different, all the countries in the, uh, of the world have come together and they have, just, they've made these conventions and there are many flyways um, that um, countries, uh, protocols that countries agree to, to protect these flyways, okay, we come under the Central Asian flyway, okay, and there are many flyways like this, I think there are six of them. So this whole, to keep these flyways safe for the birds to migrate, many countries have to agree on certain terms and conditions, right? So these global conservation strategies come out of these migration studies that happen. Of course, awareness is always there. Uh, leads to creation of protected areas, right? We talk of these Ramsar sites. Uh, with our migration studies, we can, People, researchers can do more studies. There will be more international cooperation. Uh, maybe habitats can get restored because we have the data to show that the negative impact um, of not restoring a particular habitat, uh, what happens when a particular habitat degrades, what are the losses that uh, the not only, how should I say, the bird pop population experiences, but how it impacts even us, right, um, humans. Because unless, often we, will, we are rather self-centered, unless it impacts me, unless it hurts me, I really don't bother so much, right? If it's happening to somebody else, it's all right. It's still distant. But um, sometimes these studies also show that, yes, it is impacting birds, but it's also impacting us. If it is impacting a bird, which is an insectivore, which is hence an, a natural pest uh, control for the farmers, by taking away the habitat for the bird, and if that bird disappears, there will be more pest, less grain, less produce for the farmers, and hence less food for us to eat. Um, so a lot of studies also kind of make these connections, right? And then uh, nothing, nothing works without involving the local community. So no matter where we are, no matter uh, how we study birds, or how we want to conserve not only birds, right? Like I said, when I end up conserving birds, I also end up saving myself. Uh, we always do it with the involvement of the local communities. Uh, we saw it with the Amur Falcon and we saw it with the Great um, uh, Arjun stock, right? Involving the local communities, getting their buy-in, once the, getting them to protect the birds, there's nothing, no better success story than that. And then of course, uh, having sustainable practices, following sustainable practices, practices that uh, not only help us, but not only help the birds, but also end up helping us, helps, you know, in conservation. Now, today, thanks to bird watchers, patterns of seasonal migrations are clearer. This is taken from eBird. Okay, I think we saw this briefly yesterday, or I didn't show it to you yesterday. But if you go to eBird and you go to bar charts under explore, uh, you will have explore species and explore regions. And then you have below that bar charts. And you can see for a particular bird, you can, you know, the data that you see here. So the green, the thicker the green line is more number of those birds. And then you see that the bar headed goose, for example, is not there between uh, mid April to mid October. Okay. And then how the knobbill duck is there all year round. So it is probably a resident bird. I used to think it was migratory, but I realized later on that it's a resident bird. Don't get to see it so often in uh, around my place. Okay, and the pied kapu. So you, thanks to all the bird watchers and the data that uh, you and I and all of us are putting in, we now get a better view of the patterns of seasonal migration, right? Ah, all right. Two more and two more minutes, and I'll let you go. And I hand it over to Samakshi. Okay. Uh, likewise, thanks to the data that is uploaded by you and I, by bird watchers, uh, it is possible to visualize country-wise migration today. So look at this is the bird eater flycatcher, and look at where it is in. So the distribution in the country also becomes evident thanks to the data that we are giving. Where am I seeing the bird at which time? 
you know, so that kind of information is also available countrywide, not only year-wise, but country-wise, region-wise. And just two fancy little things I want to show you all. Uh, this is the, it's a beautiful, it's there on the Bird Count India website. And I think Samakshi will walk you through this website too. Uh, look at the bar-headed goose. If you look at the frequency in India, uh, the little box in, on your right bottom of the screen, those are the months of the year. And then see how the bird moves. And all this cool things or this cool migration data that you are seeing here, that you are able to visualize, that you are able to experience is thanks to inputs by you and me, right? So I kind of really like when I see these graphs. I'll show you one more. Um, like I told you yesterday, I am in great awe of the Amur falcon. So I just had to show you uh, the Amur falcon. Okay, look from where it comes and how it moves from India and then it goes, it flies back. Now the Amur falcon takes the same path uh, to and fro. There are some birds, the, so did the bar little goose, but some birds you will see they take a different route when they are doing their return migration. Right, so just our contact numbers, uh, contact email IDs and our Instagram handles just in case you all want to get in touch with us. And with that, I hand it over to Samakshi. Uh, that's all from me for today. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Samakshi. I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Jay. Um, I share my screen. Just let me know if things are clearly visible, available. Yeah, I hope things are clear and available. Yes, yes. Okay, so everybody, um, somebody a few days ago had asked that, uh, sorry, day before yesterday had asked, what's the point of uploading all of this data? What's the use? Why are we using these databases? And one of one of the things that answers your question is the maps that Chai just showed you, the migration maps. All this data, all this understanding of how the Amur falcon migrates or how other birds migrate has come from the data that people like you and me, uh, the data that, the information that you and me upload on eBird. Um, and I will take you through some resources. There might be too many links. But uh, we will share this with you and you can, you know, take your own time in reviewing them. So the first thing is the Bird Count India website. Uh, the Bird Count India manages the eBird portal for India. And here there are a lot of things here. You get to know about events that are coming up. Uh, for example, a bunting count is happening. Don't get overwhelmed by the amount of in information I'm giving. I'm just trying to take you to the website. We have a list of the counts that are coming up, all the events that are coming up. I am personally really looking forward to the Salim Ali bird count. Um, anyone in the Northeast, you can see if you would like to contribute to the Tohu Imong bird count. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And you can get all details about the event uh, on the website. It's birdcount.in. Um, then we have migration maps. So this is where you can get access to or you can view the migration maps. So look at this for common crane. We have a you know kind of a cluster here in Europe, and then the bird seems to be coming to India and migrating to other places. And then you have maps to know about its uh, migration according to the season, specifically for India. And similarly. Um, this information is available for other other places too. Thanks, Chai, for uh, putting in the link. I just lost the chat. Okay, one second. Um, is my screen visible, uh, Chai? Yes, your screen is visible, Samaksh. I think on top you would see a panel which keeps you know floating, a kind of a floating panel over there. You should see the chat window. Okay, I think there's some some glitch, but take okay. it. So then, taking you to another another uh, aspect through these all top down menus, you can open up different um, pages. One of them is the regular birding events across India. 
So the list of events that are happening, and again, you have a lot of contacts here if you want to get in touch with somebody, contribute to something, learn more about birth. I mean, of course, all of most people working here are working as volunteers, so they're not like obliged to reply, but people will generally get back to you whenever they have time. Um, so please feel free to reach out to people. We also have all women's uh, nature walks happening. Uh, it's It happens quite often in Bangalore and uh, Chai is also involved in conducting or participating in some of these in Kolkata. Chai, would you like to tell something about it? Yeah, so in, in Calcutta, we are still uh, small. I mean, we've just had, I think, four four or five walks in Calcutta. Um, I mean, it's just for women, organized by women. It's very, how should I say, democratic. We decide on a date, we decide on a place. And then we just all walk, look at all things nature. I mean, we look at birds, somebody's looking at snails, somebody looks at uh, butterflies, uh, other creepy crawlies, bugs. Uh, I mean, we look at everything. Each one has, and then, you know, we kind of um, summarize all that we have seen. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. Uh, we do it once a month, at least once a month. And uh, our group is gradually growing in Calcutta too. I think, in fact, uh, Samakshi Priyanka, who's here, she had registered for this and then she also came for one of our walks. So, oh, nice. That's yeah, nice. so that, that was really cool. Nice. So, yeah, I think we have we have some information there. And uh, anybody, any questions, please, put in, please, please keep putting them in the chat. Uh, the next thing I will show you about is, so there is something called the Great Backyard Bird Count, where for uh, four days every year, there is this um, intention to document and do a lot of bird watching across four days across India and also in other places in the world. And uh, on this page, on the Great Backyard Bird Count page, you can also find contacts of state coordinators or um, also other people who might be involved in in bird watching and you can again reach out to these people if you need any help um so yes the list is here um these are all things from the bird count india website so i'm not not showing you something some different website or something so don't think that these are too many things you need to be mindful about once you open the website you'll find everything and yes we have information about bird watchers their own experiences these are very fun uh blog posts to read so please feel free to uh, spend some time doing this whenever you get the time and now i will come to another very important output a very important output again answering the question what is the use of uploading all this data what happens with it so one of the things that happens is that this data is used to understand how india's birds are uh, faring what are the birds that are reducing what are the birds that are increasing in terms of numbers how is the range or the area across which birds are found, how is that changing? And uh, there is a group of organizations, 13 organizations which have participated in making the, the state of India's bird report. I will not open everything and show you, that will just be too much and not the best use of our time. But yes, it, it helps us. So 942 birds have been assessed and uh, several thousands of observations by people uh, like you and me have been used to come up with an understanding of uh, birds. And some interesting findings, I will just tell you very quickly, the peafowl has been found to increase. Could anybody guess which is the most common bird in India? No slides for that, but yes, which is the most common bird across India? Any guesses? Crow. Guess, guess. Common man, huh? crow, house sparrow, okay. More, more guesses. Eget, okay. Okay, more guesses. Parakeet, pigeon, feral pigeon. I would have honestly guessed feral pigeon, but it's actually common man. Huh? And this information has again uh, come out through this uh, report. So yes, there are a lot of very interesting observations that you know we can learn about. The report is freely down, uh, can be downloaded from the website. Please feel free to do that. And you can also learn about the methods that are used. And there is a lot of information here for anything that you need. If you go to the search birds box and say, um, I type, 
इंडियन स्कीमर में भी इफ आई डू दिस आई कैन गेट मोर डिटेल इंफॉर्मेशन अबाउट वेयर द बर्ड इज फाउंड अक्रॉस विद सीजन एंड हाउ द बर्ड इज डूइंग सो देर आर थ्री कैटेगरीज इन विच बर्ड्स आर कैटेगराइज वन इज हाई कंजर्वेशन कंसर्न विच इज ऑफकोर्स वी नीड वेरी अर्जेंट कंजर्वेशन अटेंशन वी नीड टू कंजर्व द हैबिटैट वी नीड मोर इंफॉर्मेशन and then there's moderate conservation concern and low conservation concern what we also learn about is how the population has been declining or increasing or kept the same across um the years and this information is also available for each state if you scroll down you can look into some states maybe not for all states uh, there there won't be information about each bird from all state but yes some states do have that information another tool we have here is mena um this is something that can help you understand which birds are common in which area and give you very specific information about a uh, different site so i already i've already typed in what i wanted to there is one place that i worked in it's called seri in himachal and i just want to tell you uh, certain things about if you just want to know what are the birds there what are the common birds what's the probability that you can record some bird maybe some other information how can you get it so here i'm just typing the name of the report seri some dates that i have given in and this will be himachal district will be shimla and the village that i am talking about which is already a location on ebird is seri village one of i would say the best places ever so here we immediately get to know that there are uh, 56 species reported in this region 11 of them are migratory which of them are in high priority list which of them are in schedule 1 uh in our wildlife conservation act and a lot of other information and also uh, we get to know about the probability of of finding a bird um in a particular area so what this means is 22% so for chair pheasant the probability of finding a chair pheasant or reporting a chair pheasant when you go there to bird watch is 22% and these are very simple calculations i will not but still you know get into them but all this information is very easily available for any area you can type in your district some hotspot all of that information is available another aspect of data vis visualization though ajay has already shown this is when you go to ebird and you look for any species you can look at the graphs here so here there is an option of weekly bar chart and you have to select a region so i will just put in rajasthan so it's loading yeah so we don't have the species here at all you can see that in the map you can also see it through the graphs but if i put in say uh, tamil nadu it's a lot more common throughout the year almost at the same frequency of reporting which means the the probability that you will be you know finding the bird in january or december at a place is roughly the same there's some variation but roughly the same and on the right side you see a map which helps you see the range of the bird so we don't really have any records in rajasthan nothing in gujarat but yes down south we do some uh, more information here about the coverage of uh, e birding so again this is information that you can very easily find on the website you can open uh, you know different pages and you can you can find how many how what are the areas that are very well covered by bird watchers like you and me and what are the areas which seem to be missing so this is for himachal you don't see a lot of birding in the uh, upper areas of the northern areas but yes this is shimla here much more bird watching here so maybe that can help you plan trips or see which are areas which are unexplored where you would like to go and uh, collect some information or see birds and this is available for different states again won't get too much into the details but all of this information is available there is a lot of information available if you would like to read it and uh, chai has already shown you the migration map so i will not show them again but these are available for a lot of species on the bird count india website so i'm just showing that to you you please feel free to check this out these are i really like looking at these these maps they are very interesting another thing another resource 
other than bird count india that i would like to show you is the early bird website which is kind of made for people or you can say it's made for children or kind of beginners people who are kind of new to birding and uh, reporting or bird watching in general and there are a lot of resources here available again there are pocket guides there are flashcards uh, posters all of these things to uh, learn about birds to teach ab uh, about birds to other people maybe in a school or anywhere else it's not just for children but also for people who might just be new to bird watching a lot of uh, very interesting resources here and for those of you who might be interested in uh, more opportunities related to bird watching there are some uh, there's a website called uh, the bird alliance which is like a directory to find any information related to birds and birding in india so you'll get information about courses um about maybe some articles some other interesting things coming up um and all of this information is available available here technical information as well as general information can be found at the website so please feel free to uh, check this out whenever you get the time so um i think that that covers all the resources that i would have liked to show um if there are any questions please put in whether about these websites or pages or any other any other thing please put in your questions today's session has been a little heavy with regards to uh, information but if there are any questions please feel free to ask or if there's anything that you would like us to explain or please let us know chai is there anything you would like to add no no nothing really samakshi i think Hmm. We've probably given them too much information today. Really. Yeah. All these, all these things that I have shown today, I will <laughs> we will be sharing them on the group and just explore them at your own pace. A uh, little, little information heavy, but yes, we wanted to give an a very holistic view of bird watching and the resources available. So yes, please put in your questions, guys. I hope you have not uh, dozed off with the amount of information coming. I think if you also have any general in, uh, question that you yeah, other than the session, yes, yeah, other than the session, please uh, go ahead and ask. I mean, if we have the information, we'll give it to you. If we don't, we promise to, you know, find out and let you know. Varesh lives close to IIC. I also live close to IIC. Um, any contact? Um, uh, you can you can maybe you and I can get in touch. Um, if you would like to go birding, we can go along. Or yes, there are you can check out the website. There are a lot of uh, state coordinators. If you knew so many contacts, you can contact a lot of people. A lot of people in Bangalore are conducting and going for bird walks. I also might be going soon, so maybe we can we can tag along with it. I need suggestions regarding optics. Can you suggest a good price worthy binocular under ten k? Uh, that's a, that's actually a tough question. Um. It's a little difficult to answer. I mean, there are a lot of things you'll have to look into. Um, in India, I think the brand that is no, it's it's all right, Bhavya. The topic is fine. I, I do understand binoculars are important. Uh, one of the websites you can check out is maybe for Pentax. It has quite a lot of binoculars. Um, what else? I mean, there are people who maybe when they go abroad, they do get binoculars to India, but then there are no service centers in India. All that is not very uh, nice, but. Any any suggestions, Chai, on the binoculars? I was going to suggest Pentax too. I think Kalzeis is more expensive. Uh, um, Pentax is there. Even Nikon makes binoculars. Uh, they are, I think, last when I checked, they were around five to seven k. And I don't know the current price. I, uh, but Nikon binoculars are again okay. So, so also, I think it's important for you to know uh, more than the price. Um, you know the how should I say? The magnification and the clarity, you know. So we normally say an eight by forty or eight by forty-two binocular is best for birding. It, you know, very often we think a ten by fifty is better and things like that. Not necessarily, or uh, in fact, it's it it's not good because there, you know, with just a little bit of movement, there's a how should I say it? The magnif because the magnification is so much uh, more. Um, it's it's more disturbing than helping. So if you are more interested in binoculars, go for an 8x40. I think Celeron or Celtron, I think. They make, uh, um, you know, 
the uh, telescopes in the US. So they also have, uh, I think with, within 10K, you might get them on Amazon, their uh, uh, binoculars, they're also quite good. You know, do a little bit of your own. Yes, Celestron, correct. Celestron. correct. Okay. correct. I also have an 842 and I'm liking it. I've yes. Uh, quite recently, but also Bhavya, whenever you're buying, please look into if there is if there are service centers available, what is the warranty and all of these things. Um, I had also been wanting to buy like a cheapish one, but then I couldn't find something that people were saying that, oh, this is good, you can buy it. So I did go for a slightly more expensive one, but um, even if you have this key, you know, I want it to be under the budget, just look at what, where are the service centers available, what is the warranty, what is the service like, how do they deliver? So you'll have to look into that. I mean, I think it's difficult to just tell you a model and everything right now. There's so many things you'll start considering. What is the weight? Um, how bright does the viewing experience be overall? So you'll have to look into it. Also the clarity of the glass and all of that you know, kind of matters. So my suggestion would be if you have any store where you can go and check them out, you know, use them, feel them, etc. Uh, you know, how, like she said, how heavy is it? How does it feel when you're holding it and things like that? It'll be nice, um, but um, yeah, but we are, I am using a Pentax. Um, so yeah, there are service centers of that in India, and a decent warranty period. But yeah, it was a little more than ten k. Yeah, that's the one. Bushnell is also good. You're right. Bushnell is also good. I've never used one myself, but from reputation, yes. Yeah, you saying I feel very attached to my uh, binoculars. It becomes a very important thing. Any other question? Got a good one at 2.5k and it is also good for beginners who works for me, Kassam. So I would suggest if for one who don't have binocs or one cheap one for starting. Okay, what we can do is maybe uh, uh, Tasneem and Aparna, maybe for like a few hours or maybe a day or so, we can let the, uh, we can allow people to communicate in the chat so that people can answer such questions for each other uh, on the WhatsApp group. And I think that would be a better place to discuss these details of binoculars and all. Is that possible, Tasneem? Yes, uh, we can do that. We can open the chat. Thank you. So we can do that. These binoculars discussions, we will continue on the group. Um, other people, any any other questions? Okay, the group is open. So everybody, please, is binoculars discussions. Let us take it forward there. Otherwise, this will be never ending. Um, yeah. Other questions, everybody? Is there any platform where I can learn acoustics from basic to advanced? There are some videos available on, uh, uh, I think, the Bird Count India channel. I will share some more links on the groups. Uh, on so our you can use Xenocanto, no? They can yeah, Xenocanto. Xenocanto is another database where a lot of people upload their calls, they um, explain it, uh, they might write some observations. Uh, acoustics, if you want to learn how to edit and all, also as Chai had shown you some, uh, uh, what do we call it, some names yesterday. I personally used Ocean Audio, very easy to use, very friendly. So a lot of videos are available. You can check them out, I will share them. I will share them on the group. Maybe if I don't do it today, I will do it tomorrow. I will surely share these videos. Any other questions? Also regarding the advanced part, um, Vishwajit, it's not very uh, like uploading to eBird and all of, for that you're using, using bioacoustics. It's not actually very, you don't need to be very advanced at it. They're very basic things. And it's also made in a way the protocols and the suggestions are in a way that more and more people can, uh, you know, learn. So these are very simple. So it's not like there's a big learning curve if you want to upload things to eBird. Nothing like that. It's made user friendly. Um, Darshit, in order to get in touch with you, can we text you at your Instagram handles? For me, yes, you can. Um, Chai, Chai also, yes. Yeah. Tasneem, I had one question. Sorry, my audio isn't supportive. No problem. But in movie, we see pigeons carrying messages to a particular person and they always get it to the right person. How accurate is that? Or is it entirely false? Uh, 
I think there's some training that goes there. I'm not very. I think these are the homing pigeons. So there is, um, and that that is one of the. I think there is a beautiful um, podcast on BBC where they talk about how these, how birds, you know, know exactly like this, and they know exactly where to go, and they talk of these homing pigeons that they know exactly where to go, and that's where you know I was telling that initially they use smell, and then when they are closer to their the place, you know, then they use the visual cues. Uh, maybe I could also share those podcasts with you all. It, it's about um, bioacoustics in general. So you will, I'm sorry, migration in general. So there is bird migration, but there is also, they also talk about, you know, turtles and other uh, whales, etc. But it's an interesting, um, you know, there are two parts to that uh, podcast. It's a BBC podcast. Maybe I could share that and so it is accurate. Um, it's not false. Uh, birds do know exactly where to go. You will find many birds, like I see year after year, these say, I mean, I don't know whether it's the same individual because I'm not tagging them. But uh, uh, when they when you tag birds, you can actually see that it's often, you know, the same bird has it comes back. And that's how people study, study them, right? So I it wouldn't be false. It is not exaggerated. Birds are special that way. <laughs> yes, in a lot of uh, groups, they ring birds. They attach a ring to the bird and you'll see that even they seem to be returning back to a very specific patch over the years. Very, very fascinating to study bird migration. Um, and yeah, Chai will, Chai will be sharing the links with us. Yeah, of course, these qualities, I mean, birds are so fascinating. I mean, what are they not doing? Um, I mean, crazy. Other, any other questions, please? I think there are no more questions. Mm -hmm. So is it okay if we proceed towards concluding the session now? And oh, yes. I, I want to add something else. Yeah, yeah, I was trying to mention something, but I think my audio was muted. So yeah, I will be sharing the links maybe uh, in some time, today or tomorrow, and uh, also links about how to uh, edit bird calls to upload. Also, Chai will also be um, uh, sharing some okay. links. I'll do it tomorrow, please, because today is a little tight, but I'll definitely do it by tomorrow. <laughs> we will be, both of us agree on that, we will do it. And also, uh, if there are any questions for now, I think the group has been open. If there are questions, you can please chip it in there. We will try to uh, reply to as many as possible and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to them slowly. And uh, all these binoculars discussions, please feel free to give your suggestions to your peers. And maybe me and Chai will also get some ideas for the next purchases we make. So yeah, that, that is all from my end. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for attending. And yes, a lot of information. I hope you were able to uh, take something. And uh, uh, please, please feel free to reach out to both of us. We'll be very happy to get in touch and help you in any kind of bird watching. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Nature Sai, Tasneem and Aparna for organizing this and managing all of, all of this. I mean, it's taken quite a lot of effort, a few days, a lot of days, every now and then to get things in order. So thank you, guys. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Thank you, Nature's Eye. You've been fabulous. Uh, you know, your coordination has been impeccable. So thank you so much. And a big, big thank you to all our participants. I think you've been so active. You've asked us questions. You've challenged us. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of uh, such interactions where we learn from each other. Um, yeah, so thank you. And thank you, Samakshi. It's been a pleasure interacting and working with you. Same here, Jai. Same here. <laughs> so uh, for, for others, Chai and I have been trained together, I think, for some reviewing. Yeah. But we've never met. And <laughs> that we've just spoken while preparing for this. Over to you. Over to you, Aparna. 
Okay, so with that, we will conclude the session now. So on behalf of the Nature Sci, I would like to thank our amazing speakers today, Ms. Chai Englong and Ms. Samakshi for uh, for uh, taking these sessions and for all the information that you have given to the participants and also for giving us your time. It has been a long time, like we took three days almost and it was really amazing. All the sessions were amazing and I hope the participants also took something uh, uh, from this and will implement them in their lives in the future as well. So thank you uh, all. Thanks to all the participants as well for joining in and being so uh, active in the chats and asking all your questions. Uh, so thank you all. Before we conclude, I request all the participants, if you're comfortable, then can you please switch on your camera for a minute so we can take a group screenshot to uh, just end the session on that note. If you're comfortable, uh, whoever is comfortable can switch their cameras on. Not many, not many, it looks like. Yeah. Oh, people have been trying to attend from outdoors. That's, that's very encouraging, Maitri, thank you. I hope it was worth it and I hope you enjoyed. Okay, so I think I'll just take the picture now. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, also, Tasneem will be sharing a Google form in the participants group. So please make sure uh, that you fill that form later on. And also, if you have any questions in the uh, uh, about the sessions, you can keep posting them on the WhatsApp group and uh, we'll try to answer all of them as uh, as time permits. So once again, thank you, everyone. I hope we see you again in our future events as well. Uh, thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Happy Diwali. Oh, yes. Happy Diwali. Yeah. Happy Diwali. <laughs> thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. Bye, Swapna. Thank you. Thank you, Varish. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you Bye. so much. Happy Diwali. Bye-bye. Bye, Jai. We'll Bye, get in. Bye, everybody. Thank you.